Hi, and welcome to episode 64 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. I'm Heidi Smith-Parker. I'm a postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm Stephen Hamlin. I'm a postdoc at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Hi, I'm Tom Housley. I'm a newly minted PhD. I'm currently in academic limbo, or purgatory, maybe. <laughs> 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 so it's been a, bit, a little while since we recorded, so before we introduce our guest, I just want to jump in here. So as you heard, Stephen Hamblin is, is actually moved back across and is in the new world again. Uh, so Stephen, you're at University of Southern California. you going to brief bio of what you're going to do here? Well, when I figure that out, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, we're, we're doing, uh, I'm doing computer vision and machine learning stuff for high-throughput analysis of Drosophila. So Which is an animal. <laughs> All right, animals. I know nothing about them, but that's totally okay. He's come to the dark side, and of course, we got to congratulate Tom, who is now Doctor Tom, and uh, congratulations has, has survived the entire PhD process and has now found himself, as he said, in limbo. So, Tom, what are what was it like? Did you survive? You know, well. Um. Well, from the comments from my examiners, yes. But from my general current health state, no. <laughs> um, I, so I guess, it, guess it comes out about even. <laughs> awesome. All right, enough about us. So our guest this week is Dr. Steve Phelps, who is an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. So, Steve, do you want to say hi and tell everybody a little bit about yourself and about your work? Sure. Uh, well, I'm at the uh, University of Texas at Austin, as you, as you said. Um, along with Hans Hoffman, I founded a Center for Brain Behavior and Evolution here, uh, which has been going a couple years, not very long. And, uh, and so, uh, as you might guess, I study brain behavior and evolution. I'm kind of generally interested at the, uh, in the intersection of uh, animal social behavior and uh, social neuroscience. And then I'm really kind of interested in individual and species differences in the brain and behavior and um, asking um, what allows, what, what sort of drives the persistence of those differences, if we're talking about individual differences. Um, I'm trying to take it down to uh, uh, as low a level as we can to see if we can sort of um, get down to the nucleotide level uh, in terms of uh, genetic contributions to individual and species differences and then up to really kind of more complex uh, social behaviors and natural environments. Um, what I haven't mentioned is what I actually study, which are a couple of uh, what I like to consider exotic rodents. Um, that sounds like an oxymoron, I know. But uh, So we study um, a couple groups of rodents. The prairie voles are already pretty famous for uh, the fact that they form pair bonds. And uh, males and females form these enduring groups, I'm sorry, these enduring pairs, uh, and raise young together. Um, but a significant fraction of them don't. And, um, and then we find they're not necessarily all that faithful in the field either. Um, and so we're really interested in what's going on in the brains. And, and um, we find a kind of remarkable amount of individual differences in uh, various aspects of gene expression in the nervous system. And so we're interested in where those differences come from, how they relate to things like uh, sexual fidelity, uh, social cognition, memory, um, how those play out in the field. And then again, sort of taking those phenotypes down to the level of uh, nucleotides to see how well we can understand uh, selection operating on uh, on gene expression uh, related to these uh, complex phenotypes. So the other uh, species group that we work on is uh, is a singing mouse and its relatives. And so this is a genus Scotinomys, and uh, we've been working with these guys for a while. They live in cloud forests in Costa Rica and Panama. And um, actually, they live in cloud forests from Panama all the way up to southern Mexico, but we've been studying them in Costa Rica and Panama for a number of years. And so we're interested in, in what the song does, how they use it in, in social communication, um, population level variation uh, in, uh, in social communication, and then understanding how the brain is processing social signals and, and what are the um, genetic adaptations that might underlie such a complex uh, trait. So that's kind of the, the broad um, view of, of both research programs, and they're both really concerned with the evolution of social behavior and its, uh, and its mechanisms. 
Were you one of the first people to work on the Singing Mouse? Uh, we were the first people. To, well, actually, so there was a there was a uh, a guy named Emmett Hooper, and uh, uh, he had a student named Mike Carlton, who's uh, I believe Mike is the Smithsonian now, and uh, they're systematists, and in the old tradition of systematists with uh, lots of natural history uh, thrown in, and so they did some uh, important uh, descriptive work on these guys in the mostly in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, and then no one had really worked on them. Uh, no one had published on them for a long time after that. Um, I came across them because I was looking through field guides uh, to Central American uh, mammals. This is a lovely book by Fiona Reed um, with uh, a lot of uh, gorgeous paintings of Central American mammals. And I was just looking for a rodent that had an interesting social behavior that lived in a cool place that I could go and uh, work on. Um, and yeah, that's how we came across them. Hmm. It turns out they're relatively abundant, and so they're easy to catch. Yeah. Did you want a rodent because it would be closely related to a model system that was already being studied? Yeah, yeah. You know, in the I, in the sixties and seventies, and even into the eighties, people used to study uh, wild rodents quite a bit in terms of the physiology of reproduction and uh, that sort of stuff. But it really kind of fell off at some point, and people started to focus exclusively on lab rats, and then um, and then later exclusively on lab mice as the genetic tools became available. Um, and so when I was a grad student, I did a bit of work um, with some transgenics as a little side project. And when I compared it to the work I was doing with frogs, it just struck me how um, how powerful the approaches were. But it also struck me how um, untapped they were in terms of actually looking at wild animals and, and real kind of natural variation. Mm. Um, so this is a really stupid basic question, but how do you actually do your studies? So how do you link brain and behavioral experiments? Sure. Well, let's see. Um, so in the case of the singing mice, for example, um, we go and we catch mice in the cloud forest. And uh, my student, Brett Pash, has done a lot of really beautiful work. Uh, he's now a postdoc here at Mike Ryan. Um, he's just finishing up and about to go to Cornell. And he's done a lot of really gorgeous work um, where uh, he's done playbacks of songs in the wild in different populations. And then we'll, uh, we often catch animals from the wild and bring them into the lab and do playbacks. And then you can uh, use some pretty standard behavioral neuroscience techniques to uh, visualize what brain regions are being activated by, uh, by stimuli. And so these involve stating for uh, what are called immediate early genes. And so we use those to identify um, cells or brain regions that are active in response to hearing a song. Um, and so that, that's kind of how you, you make the link between behavioral phenomena and uh, particular brain regions. And then once you've got the brain regions in hand, you can um, look at gene expression using RNA-seq now, obviously. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, chip seek using uh, markers that target um, that specific modifications of histones uh, to target uh, both uh, regulatory regions and then specifically active regulatory regions. And the hope is that we'll be able to um, let, let, I should probably define that a little better um, to identify regions of DNA that actually um, help turn on and turn off specific genes and specific parts of the brain. And so the hope is then that uh, once we have those areas in hand, those regions of the genome in hand, we can look at the pattern of DNA variation there to test for selection and to, to link uh, things going on at the genomic level with things going on at the level of uh, proteins and cells and, and brains. So the first article I saw when I Googled you was uh, basically the headline was, Guy uses singing mice to study human language disorders. Huh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I know, I guess I know where that came from. I, I'm surprised that was the first, but... So is, is that, I mean, is that true? Is that something you're actually aiming at, or...? Well, I think that w I'm really broadly interested in social neuroscience, and certainly uh, the work, uh, you know, half of the field is about humans, and that, that's a really fascinating, a very different tradition from the animal tradition. The animal social neuroscience comes out of neuroendocrinology, and so it starts with kind of the hypothalamus, the brain region, you know, coordinating hormone release, and kind of works up into kind of higher levels of brain organization. 
but the social neuroscience work from the humans kind of starts in social psychology and starts in parts of cortex like language centers and kind of works its way a little more interior. Um, so I'm interested in that work and I think our work has a natural uh, interface with it. Um, where that headline comes from was that one of the genes that we've been studying is FOXP2. And FOXP2 has become famous over the last decade for um, being having been the first uh, gene that was implicated in specific language impairment. Uh, and uh, so people with mutations to the gene have uh, problems with a variety of grammatical, uh, have, prob have problems both producing and comprehending aspects of grammar. Um, and the idea now is generally that that's probably a, a byproduct of a more general uh, motor learning plasticity sort of thing. Um, so we are looking at FOXP2 and the singing mice to ask what roles it plays and um, whether it plays an important role in the production or perception of vocalization. Um, and, uh, and to that extent, it's related to, to language disorders. But I wouldn't say that the mouse work is necessarily primarily motivated by disease. I mean, my, it, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Go ahead sorry. It brings up uh, an interesting you know, idea. So it's kind of along the lines of um, Crow's principle, which maybe some people have heard of, which is the idea that uh, for most or all problems in biology, um, there'll be some animal for which it's most conveniently studied or for, for which it's best used. So kind of getting away from the, from the usual model scenario where you have the same white mouse and you study everything using it. Um, so I thought that was really cool. You guys are making these, are using, you know, a, an animal that is perhaps best suited for this question, which isn't necessarily done a whole lot um, in a lot of human comparative studies yet. Um, so did you, did you stumble across the singing mouse in your field guide and say, this could be really interesting and fit into my research this way, um, or did is this all you know a little less planned than that? Um, well, I, I think it was it was planned in the sense that uh, so I, I'd been my, my doctoral work was using uh, neural network models and genetic algorithms to kind of evolve model receivers in the context of um, the recognition of vocal signals in frogs. And so that was kind of an early um, exploration of my interest in, in kind of mechanistic evolution and how it relates to behavioral evolution. And so I really liked working on auditory signals specifically um, because you, you can record them, you can play them back, you can manipulate them, and uh, they give you kind of a degree of precision in your, um, in your, both your, uh, they give you a degree of pre uh, precision uh, regarding social phenotypes that's really hard to get in pretty much any other dimension, right? Um, and so having worked on frogs but been really frustrated by the state of neuro functional neuroanatomy in frogs, I was looking for an interesting rodent to work on with an interesting social behavior, but when I came across one that did some interesting vocalization, then that really resonated with me. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was looking for something, yeah, a little, no, no pun intended. Um, so anyway, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't looking for a singing mouse or to study rodent vocalization, but I was sort of um, particularly attracted by it. When uh, research came out, you know, a few years ago about the ultrasonic vocalizations in mice, uh -huh. did you feel that way about you know this crow's whatever principle? But the idea was if you're gonna study vocalization in a mouse, why not study a mouse that actually really vocalizes, not just ultrasonically? I, I mean, yeah, I felt that way. Of course, I wanted to to to, um, to belittle that work because to me it's a pretty boring phenotype by comparison. But um, but you know, there. I mean, to be to be fair, the power that you get from working with lab mice is pretty extraordinary. Um, I, I think it. I, I think it's problematic if that's all you. If that's all anybody studies, um, but I think if you have some people studying that and other people studying, um, you know, more, you know, more natural systems, then I think they, there can be a dialogue between them that's really useful. Um, yeah, I'm hoping for that dialogue because I saw that during my PhD. I saw a talk on this ultrasonic vocalizations, and everyone. I felt like people were so blown away, and we'd gone to lunch. And these are all molecular biologists. 
I was like, do you guys know that there's a, a mouse that actually sings? And then I showed them the video. <laughs> this is before I knew you. And yeah. everyone was like, no way. Oh, huh, like, that's then. crazy. Yeah. Did you, did you tell Michael Long about that? Do you know Michael? No. He's at he's NYU. I thought you might know him. No, uh, no. Yeah, we're, we're collaborating with him on, on, on these guys to do some fun. Uh, he's a really good systems neuroscientist, and so he does a lot of electrophysiology and things like that that, that we can't do. Yeah. There, um, how, so the colony that you have at UT, how many animals do you have? Uh, <laughs> gosh, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, but like 100, 50? Yeah, I would say 50 to 100. So okay. Probably about, uh, probably about 50, yeah, in that range, somewhere in that range. Okay. Plenty. Yeah, that's good. So do you, uh, do you have a pretty good imitation of a singing mouse? <laughs> you know, I, I don't. I could, I could imitate the tungra frogs just fine, uh, but the singing mouse is kind of hard, a little high pitched. I'm not, I'm not yeah. a fantastic whistler either. So. But. Yeah. Heidi, That's you really... should do it instead. Yeah. I, yeah, I Heidi, you're, you're think... totally familiar with these guys. You could probably do a better impression than I could. Because um, they always turn their heads and they're like, oh! That's what I can do. They do something kind of like this. I like how their paws shake when they, when they vocalize. That's yeah. That really gets me excited. Yeah, <laughs> I really like it. During my postdoc interview, I met with Steve, and I told him that if he ever ran out of money, that he should just put a bow tie on that shit, and, you know, you would never, you would never be short a dollar. It, 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 might, it might come to that. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> you, never, you never know. Yeah. I, uh, I'm just imagining my iCook protocol for the bow tie. <laughs> right? Can you imagine filling out the parts and they're like, Dr. Phelps, how will you be monitoring if the bow tie is too tight or the animal seems distressed with his outfit? <laughs> if the so animal looks more high pitched than usual. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the animal looks lethargic or uh, has, has matted fur, we'll infer that the bow tie is too tight. Yeah, <laughs> when weight loss true. goes below 85% of animal minimum weight. Uh, yeah. That's kind of a long way to wait to a long time to wait to figure out the bow ties too tight. But. Yeah, yeah, that might be. It. I guess you could monitor breathing rate or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> it might be a lot. Um, so to sort of switch gears, I wanted to ask. So when did you start, and why did you start using Twitter? Uh, well, let's see. I started using Twitter um, about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, not so. Not I was a relative latecomer. Um, and uh, I started using it, I was just kind of curious about social media in general and um, was thinking about uh, uh, starting an a animal behavior blog that I've discussed with you, which is still not live by the way. <laughs> uh, and um, I, yeah, I, I was kind of intrigued by it, like a lot of folks I think, a lot of academics in particular, I, I thought it was probably uh, worthless, um, but I tried it anyway. And uh, and was kind of surprised. Like I never use Facebook. I never have been a big user. But uh, but I really like the fact that on Twitter you could just follow you know anyone you want. And uh, so to me it's like being at a academic conference that uh, that you don't really belong at. And uh, I re I really like that aspect a lot because I feel like I can eavesdrop on a lot of interesting conversations. And, Kind of take the temperature of a field and understand things that that you know the kind of understanding you get from conversation that that's hard to get just from reading, reading literature. But, yeah, uh, it's one uh, it's one amazing aspect. Like you can directly ask someone who's like more of an expert in that field about a paper. It yeah, really brings yeah, a lot of a lot of things closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you know, people are often or constantly commenting on papers they find interesting and they're papers that you know I wouldn't necessarily know about otherwise uh, and uh, including you know links to uh, bio archive things and, and all sorts of uh, all sorts of cool stuff so yeah I, I think that's great um, I, I use it in my uh, my classes as well I've kind of experimented using a variety of different kinds of things as uh, as uh, what do they call them personal response systems or something I, I've taught several big classes. When I was at the University of Florida, I taught three sections of 300 students, and so I had about 900 kids uh, at, at a time. Um, and when I was there, I, I experimented with uh, using um, text messaging to uh, for students to, to 
post responses to questions and to ask questions. And I really liked that a lot. Um, and then uh, after I came here, I decided to give to give Twitter a try, and that's been that's been really fun as well. And uh, one one fun thing about it is that it kind of opens up uh, a whole variety of other um, potential participants, and so you can reach. Um, a lot more people, and the students can reach their friends, and, and so the, the the scale of it is just bigger. So it seems like everybody who's been in academia and used Twitter has, at some point, gotten questions like, "Why?" or "What's the point?" Yeah. But do you feel like you have, because because you're at a slightly higher level, I mean, you're an associate professor. Uh -huh. Have you gotten more of that? Do you think? Uh, you mean like for my colleagues? Yeah. Or, yeah, especially uh, older colleagues. Yeah, Mike hates my uh, Mike hates Twitter. <laughs> no, yeah, my no, my colleagues just you know they don't. Um, I mean, I've got a couple colleagues that use it, um, but uh, but by and large, um, I don't think anybody really sees the point. Um, and you know, I, I think you just have to be okay with that. You know, the technologies change, and the way people use them changes, and. Um, I think the the secret is like you can't do it expecting to be recognized for it, but if it's worth doing on its own merits, then uh, then it's you know then it's worth it. But, uh, but yeah, I, I I definitely I've been asked about it, and I and I've been I I had a, a colleague I respect a lot suggest that I had not uh, tweet at seminars or anything like that because it was disrespectful and, and self indulgent. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, so anyway, so I don't tweet at seminars. Uh, There's, I have this issue with seminars as well because people say, oh, it looks like you're text messaging. Yeah. Well, you know? like, and that's, what looks, I, that's what it looks like to you because you only use your phone one way. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah but you it, know, the guy in the back with his laptop writing a paper, that's totally fun. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And there's always that one guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Steve, I think you've tweeted one of my seminars before, and I, I was flattered. Yeah. Flattered. Well, there you go. I, I appreciate that. I also, I don't know if you know, I'm sure you noticed, but I got a detail wrong in that tweet. <laughs> yes. That's I, like, okay. I, like, I like named the wrong kind of receptor or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay, though. <laughs> and I was like, well, he was there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Was the social, social media peer review picked that up and, and corrected, no problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard sometimes because you can't go back and edit your tweets. I do this. I do this a lot. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, I don't know. I do see that at UT. Some of the older generation are really resistant or see no value in it because uh -huh. it's not. Yeah, it's not as if your lab where you were going to become famous from using Twitter. But there are really great scientists out there who use Twitter and use it oh, in a really effective way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was yeah, on a I, panel with someone just. Not a few months ago, that she was a she was an elder figure in the field, and she basically said it, it'll ruin your career if you use social media. She's saying this to a room full of grad students. <laughs> I, had to, I had to resist the urge to just leap across the table. And throw yeah. <laughs> I, I th yeah, I I don't think it actually hurts anybody's career. I think uh, I think you just can't expect it to be appreciated. I, mean, I have heard people denigrate people for blogging or other things like that, um, but but I don't think you know, I, I think if your record is there and you know your work is good, then the worst case is that they're going to see it as a, as a distraction. But uh, but the best case is they actually appreciate it. And uh, anyway, I, I, all these things just take time to catch on. Uh, actually, one of the things she said, which almost seemed almost seemed reasonable. Was she kept saying, "Well, you know, I I already have my network. You know, I don't need Facebook. I don't need Twitter. I I already know everyone I need to know. So why would I use these things?" Yeah. And that kind of made sense in why you know senior people in the field might not see as much value in it. Uh -huh. They're not going to get it. They're not looking to network. They're not looking to meet new people. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see that. I think uh, it's. Uh, it, it, I mean, I think it's really fun to. Hear what people I don't have formal collaborations with are thinking about. It does it does give you a chance to really get outside your field in a way that is really hard otherwise. Um, yeah, I I, I um, I'm not sure what the uh, what the concern is about 
using social media, but uh, but I do think that there's this kind of funny. Well, one of the funny, unpleasant things about academics, you know, we're, we're mostly really lucky to be doing this. Mm-hmm. But uh, but one of the unpleasant things about academics is sometimes there's a kind of uh, a need to um, seem like you work harder than anybody else. <laughs> and you know, we can't all work harder than everybody else. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, uh, I put in 200 hours last week in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was, uh, and you, you see that on Twitter too, of course. Like, uh, I forget there was a, uh, a hashtag uh, last year sometime that was, uh, that was uh, something called like you know lab confessions or something, and like almost there were all there are a lot of uh, quite well known people whose whose tweets were really like kind of. Frustrating, humble brags like, "Oh, I, you know, I once spent seventy-two consecutive hours pipetting or something like that." And, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't exactly a confession that uh, that anybody really cared to hear. I think. You know, Jeremy Fox wrote a, a piece about that a little while ago on the Dynamic Ecology blog. It was uh-huh. actually, I'm not really a huge fan of the blog, but it was a really nice piece because it it basically said this like, "Look, you don't have to work eighty hours a week." To be an academic, and people who tell you otherwise are full of it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. I mean, I do think you have to work a lot, um, but I think that you no, know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and you have to manage. I mean, I think the main thing is just to use your time efficiently. One of the most successful uh, scientists I know, as a grad student, was married and had two kids, and he just worked nine to five when he was a grad student. And uh, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he were in the National Academy soon. Um, and uh, you know, it was just when he was at work, he was working really hard and really efficiently. And uh, I think that uh, I think that that's you know, forty hours is it's hard to get ahead at forty hours, but if you're as super efficient as possible, um, but uh, but you certainly don't need to work some of the outrageous weeks that people talk about. Um, I think people tend to overstate it a lot as well. I think there was uh, a girl I knew in my old department whose supervisor said that uh, during his PhD that he never left the lab before 11 p.m. And yeah. I was just thinking, you, you probably did. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe once or twice. <laughs> yeah, maybe once or twice. Maybe once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> There's no guarantee either that putting in that many hours actually makes you more efficient or more productive. Yeah, you may right. actually put in eighty or hundred hours a week, but only actually get forty or fifty usable hours out of it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you need to you need to rest to be sharp, and um, and you know we're kind of paid to be sharp. That's kind of the, that's kind of the job. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true, and you have to have like a little bit of a life outside of it. And sometimes I think, but sometimes I think Twitter is like interesting science, but not so focused on what you do. So it's kind of like having a life. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't have a life outside of like Twitter and work. I'm just saying. right, Ivy. Right. <laughs> it does sometimes turn you on to other science. It's not directly within your field. Yeah, yeah for sure. Really, be Twitter's tagline from now on. Twitter, kind of like having a life. <laughs> <laughs> I do find when people tweet about the lo- the real life they have, I'm like, what? I don't follow you because I care about you go kayaking. <laughs> I don't want to see this. I don't want to see this. Now you're just making me feel bad because I don't have a life outside Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> life shaming. So <laughs> I guess we'll just leave it there and we'll just continue on with this on Twitter perhaps at another time. Um, so, Steve, thanks a lot for talking to us today. Where can people follow along with your work on seeing mice and, and various other uh, questions that you'll be pursuing? Oh, sure. Well, I would uh, direct them to a website, which is the Center for Brain Behavior and Evolution website. That's bbe.cns.utexas.edu. And uh, then on Twitter, you can uh, follow me at evilbrain, E-V-O-L-B-R-A-I-N. And, uh, and then the, um, the center has a, has a um, handle as well on Twitter, and that's wethink1837. And, uh, yeah. Those are the places. All right, awesome. awesome. Well, thank you, guys. That was a lot of fun. Hey, no problem. It's our pleasure to have you here.
for everybody yeah. listening at home, we'll make sure to put all of those links up that Steve just mentioned, as well as video of the singing mice, which is adorable at the same time. Uh, we'll put those all on our website at breakingbio.com. And as always, you can always contact us and let us know what you think of our show by contacting us at Breaking Bio on Twitter or by leaving a me message on Facebook by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast. That's it for this week. Hope you'll join us next week when we have a new guest. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.